so uh, thank you for coming. I, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the research we have done on uh, bioelectromagnetics and wearable health monitoring. So my lab is mostly focused on using electromagnetic waves for biomedical applications, which I'm going to talk about. And also some part of my lab, we're doing, uh, we're developing wearable systems for uh, heart health monitoring. Uh, so uh, the three main uh, research projects which we have ongoing right now uh, are high resolution millimeter wave imaging for skin cancer detection. Uh, we are also doing non-contact heart health monitoring uh, using the Doppler radar technology. Uh, and finally, we are developing health monitoring, wearable health monitoring system for detecting a cardiomechanical signal. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, millimeter wave imaging for skin cancer detected. Uh, so millimeter waves, uh, as we know, is that uh, region in the electromagnetic spectrum which lies between microwave and terahertz regime, so between 30 to 300 gigahertz. Um, so the application-wise, uh, millimeter waves are currently used for security scanning. Uh, non-destructive testing, so this is like the security screening in the airport, they use this technology. Also, NDT or non-destructive testing systems. Uh, this is the major application of this technology right now. So what we want to do is to extend the application of this technology to biomedical imaging. So it has not been uh, applied to bioimaging so far. Uh, so, uh, what, where we got the idea was uh, they're using uh, electromagnetic waves in the lower frequency spectrum or microwave spectrum. Currently, it's being used for breast cancer imaging, uh, actually breast and lung cancer, brain imaging. So, this is already well developed. It's been ongoing for a couple decades uh, and it works very well uh, because it, there are high dielectric con uh, contrast between malignant and normal tissue, the, between the electromagnetic properties of malignant and normal tissue. Uh, so what we wanted to do uh, is, as we go to millimeter waves, the wavelength becomes smaller, the frequency is higher, wavelength is smaller, so we can get better resolution, so we can detect smaller tumors. The issue is, uh, as the frequency increases, the penetration depth uh, becomes lower. So this frequency uh, range, uh, sorry, I'm going to so this frequency range is very suitable for sensing outer tissue layers. So it doesn't penetrate all the way to the breast or lung, but it can be, uh, it can be used for detecting outer tissue layers or specifically for skin. So we, we thought why not use it for skin cancer detection. And so the issue here is the, um, uh, so as I said, the, the high, in this frequency region, we have good resolution for lateral, uh, good lateral resolution for detecting tumors. The depth resolution or axial resolution, this is uh, proportional to the bandwidth of the imaging system. So current systems, they have a resolution of about one millimeter. For tissue imaging or cancer detection, tissue delineation, we, uh, we need a resolution of about 200 micrometers. So current systems cannot do this. Uh, they give enough lateral resolution, but not enough depth resolution. So uh, we are, what we are doing is to solve this issue, to increase the axial resolution of this technology. So there is a 5x improvement in bandwidth that is required. The current systems are in the range of one millimeter. We want to improve it by five times. So the system bandwidth uh, needs to improve by five times. And uh, so this kind of imaging system is based on antennas. There is no such antenna available that has such high bandwidth. So what we suggested to do is to uh, divide the imaging bandwidth, these ultra-wide imaging bandwidth by which we need, instead of having one antenna to cover the whole imaging bandwidth, what we suggest to do is to divide it into several subbands or channels and then use a subband antenna to cover each channel separately. Uh, so the subband antennas are placed in front of the target one by one or successively. They radiate the signal, they record the backscatter uh, responses. So then we put these backscatter responses next to each other or combine them with, via a signal integration scheme. Then it will look like as if we have a virtual antenna that's operating over this ultra-wide frequency range. So this kind of imaging approach, we named it synthetic ultra-wideband imaging. 
because the system is not ultra wide band inherently, we are just synthetically improving the bandwidth of the system. So once we use this methodology, we want to see if we can detect cancer, if it can really be used for imaging uh, cancer tissues. So uh, our motivation was skin cancer is the most common cancer in the world. 20% uh, of Americans develop this cancer during their lifetime. And uh, early stage detection is critical as with any other cancer. So as we can see, if you can detect the cancer at stage one, the survival rate is twice as high as, if, as when you detect it at stage two. So it's really important to detect it at early stage, stage zero or stage one. Uh, and how is it detected right now is, um, surprisingly, there is no imaging methodology to help the dermatologist to detect this cancer. So when there is a lesion, uh, people go to dermatologists, the only way they can detect the cancer is through inspection with the uh, aid of a dermoscope. So, uh, once, so just through the eyes, and depending on how uh, professional the dermatologist is, they can have a sensitivity of 55% to 80% or on specificity of 65 to 75. So the accuracy is very low. A lot of cancers go miss, and a lot of times unnecessary biopsies are performed because it's just not possible to detect accuracy with eyes. Uh, there are some methodologies currently used. Uh, they each have some shortcomings. Uh, so OCT, multi-photo microscopy, ultrasound. Uh, the uh, issue is in contrast. So. These are all optical methods. They are based on optical contrast. Optical contrast is different than histopathological contrast. So one major advantage of our methodology is high contrast, as, we, as was also the case for microwave imaging. So we are detecting based on electromagnetic contrast between normal and cancer tissues. So this is the main advantage. And then another advantage is our cost. So this is a relatively low cost technology which we are using. And uh, one issue that, one shortcoming is, as I said, the resolution which we are working, which we need to improve through our work. So uh, what we did, the first step of our studies is to verify this contrast. So we claim that we have a high contrast between normal and the malignant tissues. That's what we thought, that's what we infer from microwave studies. But we, we need to verify it because there has not been any large-scale studies on dielectric properties at millimeter waves. So we do this large-scale contrast study. So these are the equipment which we use. We collaborate with Hackensack University Medical Center. We collect tissues uh, that were, uh, these are discarded tissues during the most surgery process. So most surgery is the cancer, project, the cancer removal process. So they have some uh, discarded tissues. The dermatologist uh, keeps them for us. Um, so what we did, we, uh, we, we collected 146 data sets and we measured during our study. We evaluated two kind of cancers, uh, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell, cell carcinoma. So these are the two most common cancer types uh, of skin cancer. Um, so, uh, and the other thing which we did is uh, we need to develop the antennas so, uh, as I said, we develop, we uh, divide the bandwidth into four subbands. So we go from 12 gigahertz up to 110 gigahertz. So our bandwidth has to be divided into four uh, four subbands. We use each. Uh, we use a separate subband antenna for each uh, subband. So uh, as I, as we can see, the antenna shape is exactly the same. We're just scaling it in size. So as we got, as we go to higher frequencies, the antenna size is also smaller. Um, and we characterize the antennas. So we characterize the reflection properties, the radiation properties. Uh, you can see more, uh, and we, you can get more information from our publications. But uh, the antennas were separately characterized. Uh, and then we uh, developed the phantoms based on the skin studies which we did. So uh, in the skin studies, I didn't go into the details, but we observed a large contrast between both cancer types and also the normal uh, tissue. I can give more information uh, at the end uh, if you're interested. But uh, so to verify our imaging uh, methodology, we developed these phantoms based on the uh, measured properties of uh, the skin tissues, normal skin, uh, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. So we developed these phantoms. So we had to develop ultra-wide phantoms, which were stable, and also skin and tumor phantoms. 
Then uh, once we developed skin and tumor phantoms, we had to uh, put the tumors inside the skin phantom so, so, we can, so we can evaluate the system to see if the tumors can be de determined. Uh, so these are uh, some characterization results of our phantoms. So this is the normal skin, real part of dielectric permissivity and imaginary part. Uh, SCC, real and normal, and real and imaginary part. DCC, basal cell carcinoma, real and imaginary. As we can see over the this frequency range, which we measured uh, for both normal, for both real tissues and phantom tissues, we are closely following them. Uh, and we also we also have very stable tissues, so we uh, stable phantoms. So both real and uh, both real part of permittivity and imaginary part of permittivity, we measured three days and then 12 weeks after fabrication they were stable. So these are some uh, results for that. Uh, so once we get our phantoms, we have their antennas. So what we did was to set up the imaging system and image these phantoms. So in imaging, we have a, a criteria called the Rayleigh criteria, which uh, we have, we claim we want a 200 micron resolution, as I mentioned. So what we do is we need to have two canonical spherical uh, targets. We place them at the resolution that we claim. So we place them 200 microns apart from each other. And if we can detect these, if we can resolve this, then we have, we have that resolution that we claim. So we have two canonical spherical tumors, two microns between their closest edges. Uh, this is the imaging setup. We need to evaluate two kinds of resolution, lateral through the surface and axial through the depth. So we uh, place them laterally for first experiment, axially for the second experiment. Uh, so as we can see, we process them using that uh, methodology, the synthetic ultra-wide band methodology. So we have the lateral and sagittal image. So as we can see, we can uh, distinguish between the, the tumors. So the tumors are successfully resolved, uh, which shows that this methodology, uh, at least in tumors, we are, we are able to use this methodology to detect tumors. So we have the 200 micrometer resolution, which we claim. Uh, and there's, there are other some uh, criteria, which is I mean to IMAX. These are the details of the Rayleigh criteria. The maximum uh, pixel uh, intensity, the minimum divided by maximum over the line connecting the centers of the tumors. This has to be less than a certain number, so uh, it, uh, it satisfies that uh, condition. 200 microns, yes, we place them within two. The 200, 200 microns, we did at 200 microns. For now. It, it, we didn't go less, yes. yes. So it's still ongoing. Uh, we probably do that to see how much exactly. But uh, currently, our focus is to we, we have ongoing we have going we have gone to skin imaging. Uh, so that's the current focus. As as far as we have 200 microns, we wouldn't want to go to skin tissues. So that's what that's our main focus right now. So our ongoing experiments are skin tissue. So this is a long term uh, big picture of this uh, project. So what we want to do. Uh, so first of all, uh, as I said, we want to do uh, lab, uh, laboratory testing on skin. But the important step is the, in the more remote future, we want to do in vivo imaging. So go to the hospital and see if we can actually, uh, while this, the patient is there, if we can get an image. Uh, and the important thing we need to do is on benign tissue. So we can detect malignant, but if there's a benign piece of tissue, we shouldn't mix that up with uh, malignant. So we want to make sure that we, uh, we also differentiate benign and malignant as well. Uh, then our, our bigger, uh, longer term vision is to have everything, the circus, bring the circus with the antenna and have a handheld imager. So as you saw in previous slides, we have a big, uh, we use vector ne network analyzer, we have big equipment. So we want to make a handheld and compact imager, which dermatologists can use in their office. So this is an overview for uh, this first area of my research. Then uh, the second area which I wanted to talk about is using Doppler radar for heart health monitoring, non-contact heart health monitoring. So uh, we did two different works, antenna and channel characterization and then heartbeat modeling, which I'm going to talk about. So, and so um, Doppler-based heart health monitoring is, uh, works according to Doppler radar theory. So according to this theory, 
the displacement of a target results in a phase shift in, a, in the reflected signal from the radar. So uh, what the, this technology does is to record the wireless reflections of the chest wall uh, and demodulate this phase information to obtain heart uh, health information. So uh, this technology has been used for several decades and uh, there is some ongoing work in it, but there are several important challenges which haven't been addressed yet. The most important one is, the first important one is that the channel and environment characteristics are unknown, are currently unknown. So the channel characterization results that people use are based on outdoor radars and mobile systems, which doesn't hold true in uh, indoor radar and with close distances between the radar and the, the target. And also, there is, there, are, there is a lack of accurate heartbeat extraction models. And so as we can see, the heartbeat signal is very weak compared to respiration signal and the environmental noise. So we can see here the amplitude is much lower than respiration, and the effective part of the body, which we can measure it from, is also much smaller than the effective part which we can measure the respiration from. So there is not, there's not, uh, there's really not a efficient method to extract this information, this weak signal information. And then finally, uh, this technology is limited to single person scenarios. So uh, every time you want, we want to test the system, it has to be in a laboratory, isolated laboratory, only one single person in the environment. Because uh, if there's more than one person in the environment, the reflected phases from those two people, they're going to collide. So we're going to have an uh, issue which is called phase collision of reflected signals at the radar. So they're going to mix and we cannot separate them. So this is the final issue of these technologies. Um, so we have worked on all three. Uh, we have uh, done some result, uh, some research on both, all three of these areas. So uh, the first one, uh, as I said, was channel characterization. So uh, this is the area which hasn't been done much at all. There's, uh, most of the research in this area is on transceiver design, so circuits and uh, the transceiver. But um, there's limited research on int antenna effect on system performance. How does the antenna, what kind of, how does the antenna affect the system performance? What kind of antenna should be used as the transmitter as a tra and receiver antennas for the Doppler radar? Uh, and this is uh, basically a dynamic scenario, which is difficult or uh, actually impossible to uh, simulate. So we have to we had to do a lot of experiments on this part. And so and the antenna can be wide beam, it can have a narrow beam, it can be linearly polarized, circularly polarized. So which combination is best to use for the transmit and receiver of the antenna? So uh, what we did, we uh, we did, we took a radar, a classical radar at 2.4 gigahertz. We did uh, experiments uh, using linear actuator and human subject. So linear actuator so that we can control the signal, have better control over the characteristics. So here on the left, we can see the experimental setup. So this is the radar. Uh, here we can see the radar and transmit receive antennas. And this is the actuator, which goes back and forth, uh, gives a sinusoidal uh, controlled uh, movement. We can control the amplitude and the frequency. Yeah. And then in the transmitter and receiver, we use four common t antenna types. So four combinations in the uh, receiver, four combinations in the transmitter. So uh, we did change the beam width, we change the polarizations of the antennas. So four by four, and then we uh, repeated each experiment five times, different distances with the target. We use two different dis distances with the target uh, to see which combination actually gives us the best result. So, here is a summary of the results for the actuator. Uh, this shows the frequency spectrum and the peaks. So um, the highest peak shows the, uh, shows the frequency which we're interested in, which is the heartbeat frequency. So uh, by looking at all of them, so here is the receiver, here is the transmitter. So in the receiver, we have a CP, circularly polarized array, linearly polarized array, single circularly polarized and the single linearly polarized. So you have single patch and array, uh, array of patches. So that, that the single and array changes the beam width and then the linearly polarized and circularly polarized is designed, we, we designed that. And we use the same combination in the transmitter. So four different types of uh, antennas, uh, 
uh, in the transmitter and four in the receiver. So this this is the four by four or sixteen element chart here. So what uh, by observing this we got an intuitive result. So the best case is shown here, the highest peak or the optimum case, which has the strongest fundamental frequency, is actually when we have a single linearly polarized antenna, the transmitter, and a circularly polarized array at the receiver, which is which is not in, which is intuitive, which is not intuitive. Uh, so transmit, as I said, linearly polarized single, receive circularly polarized array. So. Uh, the way we justify this is that in a, a linearly polarized and if you have a linearly polarized in the transmitter, circularly polarized in the receiver, so different polarization, this reduces unwanted coupling between transmit receive antennas. And also this kind of configuration, LPCP is m more robust <coughs> against polarization changes and multi-path fading. So it gets rid of unwanted signals. And then in the transmitter side, a single path is preferred so generally, you would think an array is better because array makes a sharper beam, uh, so we can, we can be more focused on the heart area. But that was not true because, um, as we can see, a wider beam can illumin illuminate a larger area on the chest wall, so we can get, a, get back a stronger signal. Uh, however, on the receiver side, the array was actually preferred because a narrower beam gives less interference from the surrounding environment. And then another interesting thing we saw was that in, in the short range vital sign monitoring system, the antenna configuration is not reciprocal. So uh, if, if we go back to this chart, uh, this is the best combination. If we swap the transmit receive antenna, the, the results are not the same. So uh, uh, on like outdoor environments, the radars that work outdoors, they're reciprocal. This doesn't hold in indoor radars for health monitoring. So we have we, uh, we have more all the complete information in our publications here. Uh, so, but the other problem which I talked about was that. Uh, uh, oh, before I go to other, uh, this is also the results of our human experiment. So we tested our uh, we tested that optimum antenna configuration on ten subjects for two different distances. So we compared standard and recommended the optimal, which we found. So especially for the case of longer distance from the radar, 1.5 meter away from the radar, the recommended case using a linearly polarized single patch in the transmitter and secondary polarized array in the receiver, especially for longer distances, this significantly improves the accuracy of the system. So it's, uh, it's very recommended to use this. So current systems, as I said, they just use a regular patch in their transmitter, regular patch in the receiver. So uh, nobody gives much attention to how to design if they need to design an optimal antenna configuration. So um, the next, uh, the second part of this work is on uh, heartbeat modeling and signal processing to extract. So we we want to find a better way to extract this weak heartbeat signal and separate it from environmental noise and respiration. So. Uh, the first thing we ta uh, we focus on is the heartbeat mechanical signal uh, because it's uh, basically considered to be a simple sinusoidal signal. So we want to see if it's really a, si a simple sinusoidal signal or not. So or what we did is we placed the man's accelerometer on the chest wall. Uh, using the accelerometer, we can uh, measure heartbeat induced chest acceleration. So this is a graph of the chest acceleration one cycle using a man's accelerometer. And if you double integrate this signal, this is acceleration, we double integrate it, it's a displacement signal, which is what the radar signal should be because radar measures displacement. So we come to the, this signal from two ways, where first from accelerometer and then from the radar. So these two should be the same. So this double integration, we fit a curve to it. With, it's a, the envelope is a Gaussian pulse, uh, which we fit to the signal. Um, so we will assume, in our work, we assume a Gaussian pulse, which is a more exact representative than a simple sign signal. And then we also use the FTPR, which is the frequency time phase regression algorithm. We use this method we, uh, combined with our Gaussian pulse model to extract a heart speed information. Um, and we verified an eight subject. Uh, we have a reference measurement, TPG, uh, the TPG finger. Sensor. Uh, 
So here shows a representative results from one of the subjects. So the reference heartbeat rate, or the PPG rate, is the blue, uh, blue curve, and the measured heartbeat rate using our method is the red one. So as we can see, we follow the reference very closely. So this is the upper 2%, this, is a, this lower line is the lower 2% line. So we mostly follow the reference within the plus minus 2% accuracy. And uh, if we calculate the total detection rate for this signal, it's, ni it's 97% for this subject. So here uh, I am also summarizing our results on this part. So this method, this FTPR method, Gaussian plus FTPR method, we compared it with a few of the other algorithms currently in the, uh, which are currently being used for two different distances, short distance and long distance. So it's, again, especially for longer distances, our algorithm outperforms the current methods that our people use in the literature. Again, uh, I didn't go into the details of the algorithm, but uh, I'll be more happy to explain later and we can find information in our publication. And then the last problem, uh, which is uh, the focus of uh, my, uh, our current work in uh, this area, is uh, multi-person detection capabilities. So uh, conventional antennas radiate one independent beam at a time. The, and then the problem occurs when we have more than one person in the environment in the presence of the radar. So in this situation, the signals collide and mix, and in, we cannot separate them. So uh, our solution is to produce multiple concurrent uh, orthogonal beams to address this issue. And this uh, is going to be the first device ever. So we are working on the first time that multi-person detection capability has been done on radar, in the field of radar. So our, our approach is to use beamforming. So beamforming is a very recent uh, novel technology. They are currently considering it for 5G networks, cellular networks. So we want to borrow this, co uh, this concept from cellular networks and use it in radar area. So theoretically, it's expected to improve system performance significantly, improve the capacity, bit rate. And, and there are a couple of different ways we can use the beamforming. Uh, we can do everything in analog. Uh, this has least complexity, but also lowest performance. We can do everything in the digital domain. It has the highest performance and most complexity. What, what we are uh, proposing is to use a hybrid approach which is a compromise between analog and digital approaches. Uh, and the, so we, we look into the work, the papers are being forming in cellular networks. Our challenge and difference with them is that in their uh, work, the targets are active, so they can communicate back with the station. Our work are the targets are passive, so we cannot directly communicate, so we cannot exactly use those methods. We just got the idea from them. Uh, and our approach, um, so basically just the overview is that in a beamforming system, each antenna in an array is formed by a A sine phi, which is signal amplitude and phase. So in conventional radars, uh, A and phi are the same. So we have one very pointed directive beam. If you have a phase array, only A is different. So in a phase array system, you just have one beam and you can rotate it. In our system, multi-beam systems, both A and phi may be different. So we have multiple beams, and we want to rotate them and have control over all of them. So, um, so this is a more com uh, more complete system, combined to phase, combined to phase array. And so the issue is how to uh, find A and C and phi to get the desired beam. So this is called the beamforming uh, algorithm, and then we have to implement this algorithm, which is called the beamforming network. So um, our current work so far, we developed a proof of concept or dual beam prototype. It works at 2.4 gigahertz, and the details are shown here. So we have the, this is our beamforming network and transmit antennas, receiver antennas. Uh, we have space shifters to in introduce the phase shift. Uh, we have the transceiver, microcontroller, SPI bus for communicating. So we have some preliminary results on this. So this is a classroom. Uh, we have two people. Uh, monitoring two people, so we were able to produce independent, two independent beams, which we created and directed to each subject. So this graph shows the restoration rate. So as you can see, we can, um, so this um, black curve is when the beam forming network is off, so we only have one beam directed at two subjects. So as we can see, 
the signatures of the subjects are mixed up. So we only have one signal. We cannot attribute it to either one of the subjects. When the beamforming network is on, we have two outputs, the red and blue outputs. So we can see the output of different channels attributed to different subjects. And so we have on this is ongoing research. We are doing a so we, we have a we're presenting the results in the Ion Bio C conference in upcoming in June and then we are extending it to the journal which we are submitting. So this is the, the work which we are currently doing. And then we want to extend it to multi beam system, millimeter wave frequencies, higher frequencies. So the, as I said, the future direction is to have this multi beam instead of well, we have a multi beam radar in the millimeter wave. So the advantages will be significant miniaturization. So we had a big circuit, we want to miniaturize it. Uh, we have a larger array and therefore more directed beams and also generate multiple beams. Uh, the, again, as we move to millimeter wave, we want to do the same channel characterization in that, in that band. Uh, use different types of pulse uh, radars, pulse radars, FMCW radars, uh, characterize those as well. And then uh, we want to further extend our Gaussian pulse model to see if we can get other than heartbeat uh, rates, so other information from the signal, other than uh, just the simple heartbeat rate, so medical information, etc. So now I move to the third part of the research which we're doing. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there, there, uh, this debate. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so they're asking if uh, there's any advantage uh, between non, if there's any advantage of non-contact monitoring compared to wearable sensing. So we can just do the same thing and better with wearable wearable sensors. So uh, that's also open for discussion, but non-contact monitoring is the several advantage is, uh, first of all, uh, unconscious monitoring. So people, you don't ha the people don't have to know that they're being monitored. So uh, for example, inside the environment, uh, so if, if they, 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 the claim is that if they're, uh, uh, if they're aware that they're being monitored, it would affect the measurement. So they would, psychologically, they would, they, they would change and affect the measurement. And also, it's more comfortable. So, if you have a burnt skin, you don't have to stick something on your. Or, uh, if you have skin issues, skin irritations, or infants, uh, they, it's better not to have something wearable on them. Or kids, they may lose their devices. Elderly people, uh, they may lose them and they not find it. So, it's more convenient if nothing is attached. It's, it's they're free. And they, yes, and they're conscious of it, so they, they, under, they, we don't want them to know they're being measured, so they're more natural state. Yeah. yeah. Affect the measurement. Yes. yes. And so, so we also do some work on wearable sensing. Uh, for uh, we are detecting the cardiomechanical signals here, so I'm going to explain more. So uh, our work is uh, similar to uh, halter monitors. So the standard wearable device in currently in clinical practice is the uh, halter monitor. It measures the EKG or electrocardiography sig electrocardiogram signal. And so there are some issues with this. So first of all, uh, we don't get uh, we get limited information. There are a lot of information which uh, this device cannot provide. So it's basically used for providing heart rhythm. Uh, and there's the lack of cardiovascular homodynamic parameters. So a lot of parameters that this device cannot give are heart valve events, systolic time intervals, and especially blood pressure and uh, other metrics. And it's bulky and requires electrode attachment uh, to the body. Uh, so for ubiquitous monitoring, uh, it's known that more capa capabilities are needed. So what, uh, and there's a, a new research that uh, recently has been focused on. It's called seismocardiography, which is a measurement of heart-induced chest vibrations in the form of linear acceleration. So it was discovered a while ago, but it's just recently that uh, with the progress of men's devices and good sensors, they're, they're being researched more heavily recently. Uh, 
due to this advance in MEMS accelerometers. So this signal is a mechanical signal because it detects the movement, so it inherently contains a heart valve opening and closure event. Here we can see a representative seismocardiogram uh, during one cycle. So as we can see, there are several events. These six are all heart valve events, which are recognizable on the signal. So it represents more information than electrocardiogram, or at least complementary information to that. And, and then, the, so seismocardiogram was the measurement of linear movement. Uh, parallel to that, we have gyrocardiography. This is much more recent than that. Uh, again, it measures movement, but this one is rotational component from the chest wall. So, in, and so we, our group and another group, we were we recently, we were the two groups that recently proposed this method uh, a couple years ago. So uh, this one is measured using gyroscopes uh, and measures the uh, rotational speed. And then once you combine seismo and gyrocardiogram, you have a more complete sensing. We can call it cardiomechanical sensing. Uh, so here we can. So here is the um, axis here. But basically, this shows the y-axis and x-axis of GC or gyrocardiogram. The axes are shown above. Okay, so for so these two axes uh, correspond to the z-axis of the seismocardiogram. So we have one axis seismocardiogram and but two axes from gyrocardiogram. So the, uh, the main advantage of uh, cardio uh, cardiomechanical sensing. Uh, so, as I said, first of all, this measures the mechanical aspects of the heart, so we can get direct information about heart valve events and heart muscle status. Uh, and this method is MRI compatible. Uh, we use MEMS accelerometers, MEMS gyroscope, they're small, low profile, low power, and they're easy to apply. So we can just use a chest strap, double-sided strap, no need for electrode attachment, no need for professional connection. Uh, and so there are uh, some challenges that um, need to be solved. Uh, the main one is motion artifacts because, because we are measuring the mechanical movement. So, uh, of course, compared to uh, ECG and other methodologies, this is much more significantly affected by motion artifacts. Uh, and the other issue is signal interpretation, biophysical signal interpretation. So th uh, we still uh, it suffers from inter-device and inter-subject variability. And uh, what happens is we usually end up with needing an ECG anyway for detecting those points. So it's, it's still not at a point where you can use it standalone. You have to com combine it with ECG to detect the point. And then the, finally, uh, the feature extraction. So because this is so new, this methodology is so new, uh, it's still not clear what features we can extract from it what kind of diagnostic information can be extracted from this signal. So it still requires further investigation. So um, I, I want to give a recent uh, review of the recent progress in this area over the past couple of years, what we did. So as I said, there are three challenges. So we, had some, we did some work in each of these uh, areas. So first, using a single sensor, we worked on motion noise cancellation. Uh, then we went to a dual sensor setup for canceling higher levels of motion noise. So we use a more complex system, but a higher level of motion noise cancellation. Uh, and our latest work is a triple sensor setup. So we actually can uh, cancel motion noise, the, the subject while walking on a treadmill or even jogging on a treadmill, we were able to cancel this level of motion noise. I'm going to give some details later. Uh, and then, as I said, biophysical signal interpretation. We we use the first of all we use gyroscope envelope for interpreting the peaks of the seismocardiogram signal. So uh, just to detect the peaks without using gyroscope on its own as a, a cardiomechanical sensor. But once we did that, we realized that uh, this gyroscope signal itself has some information about the heart. So that's when we propose this methodology, which is called gyrocardiography. And then we have some work on combined seismo and gyrocardiography. And then in terms of feature extraction, uh, what we have done is to extract blood pressure uh, based on pulse transit time, so which is a feature which is very, very needed. Blood pressure is needed in every context. 
So this we did some work on it, and then uh, what we are doing is a smartphone only post transit time system. And then we are also working on the cardiac abnormality classification. So this is in collaboration with Columbia University. We are uh, hiring patients from them and testing our devices. So we want to see if we can uh, differentiate the signals between healthy and uh, healthy subjects and cardiac disease patients. And so uh, in terms of noise cancellation, uh, what we did with the finger sensor was to have an adaptive filter. Uh, the input of the adaptive filter was the delayed version of the cardiac signal. Uh, so using this method with a single sensor setup, uh, we could get rid of moderate motion noise. So when the subjects were turning, uh, like sitting in a chair and turning the chair, or when they were turning their bodies, uh, we could get a high detection rate. But uh, so uh, although the noise was low, the, the noise level that we could cancel was low, but the sensor, the system was also very simple. And then we move to dual sensor setup. So the algorithm is exactly the same as you can see here. We have the adaptive filter, but here instead of delaying the primary input, using it as a second input of the adaptive filter, here we use a second sensor or a reference sensor at the back. So this is the main primary sensor. This is a reference sensor at the back. We give these two as inputs to the adaptive filter, and then we get a clean signal. So using this method, we were able to improve the motion tolerance to uh, 130 millig compared to 40 millig. So this is uh, low speed walking uh, for the subject. So uh, we got enhanced performance at the cost of increased system complexity. And then we can get, we can get more information in the publication. But um, the interesting work we are doing now is we have three sensor nodes. So two are on the front. Uh, this is the main sensor. This is another reference sensor. And number three is also another reference sensor. So now, uh, this is our current research. At this time, we also know about gyro cardiography. Previously, we were only using seismo. Now we're combining seismo and gyro. So we have a lot more information to work with. Our approach is to use a blind cell separation or a constraint component analysis on both seismo and gyro cardiogram. So using this method, um, we can get high detection rates during walking and jogging on signals. This also controls the measurement. So I can give details about how we use ICA uh, later. And we also have it it's under review. This, this work is now currently under review. Yeah. Then uh, in terms of biophysical signal interpretation, um, so what our goal is to have a standalone annotation. So as I said, currently they use ECG to annotate the signal. We want to get rid of ECG, find a way to just annotate the signal from the, from the sensors by itself. So what we did was uh, for the seismocardiogram, we recorded the rotational vibration using MEMS gyroscope and then used the, that, the information from that rotational vibration use a methodology called a singular vector deposition to generate the energy envelope of the gyroscope waveform. And then we detect the seismocardiogram peak based on the envelope of the gyroscope, based on the peak location of the envelope of the gyroscope signal. And so this is a summary of what we did. Here we have two peaks. This is a gyroscope envelope which we uh, form using SVD, singular vector deposition. So we get two peaks. These peaks are, as we can see, they're very easy to detect. They're very clear compared to these so many peaks here in the SDG signal, the seismo signal. So we use these two peaks, and then we form time windows around them. Based on these time windows, we can detect seismocardiogram information. And so uh, what we got was a comparable annotation rate and our, with, with when you use an ECG, and our setup was simpler. Uh, also, another thing we found out was that these rotational components also contain cardio, cardiovascular or cardiac-related information. So this could be a new methodology for measuring heart health or evaluating heart health. And the other uh, advantage of using gyroscopes was that they show the higher motion tolerance compared to accelerometer recording. 
So here we can see signals. So this is the ECG signal. This, these are the gyro uh, from X and Y axis. This is a filtered waveform. So this is under motion noise. And this is the seismo or accelerometer waveform. So as we can see, this is totally corrupted. The gyro waveform is more resistant. It's not corrupted as much. So this is the main advantage for this technology. So we wanted to get rid of noise by using gyroscope recording, which is stable to noise. We can get rid of more, even more noise. Mm -hmm. And then what we did, so how do we use the gyroscope energy? We want to combine each, the information from gyroscope with information with accelerometer. We propose a combined model based on a dual spring damping system. So we combine accelerometer and gyroscope in a unified model. Uh, so we, we did that, and based on that, uh, so this is this shows the combined mechanical model is dual spring damping, uh, as I said. So we use that model to identify the fiducial points in the gyrocardiogram, and then the first derivative of gyrocardiogram. Because gyrocardiogram is a speed, the first derivative is a, is a uh, acceleration, and then a seismocardiogram is acceleration. So we also. Uh, um, identified this first derivative. So then we can detect the signal. So this is the first time that the gyrocardiogram was annotated. The peaks, so we found out what each peak means, how it corresponds to different uh, peaks of the seismocardiogram and other references, uh, incidence cardiogram, electrocardiogram. Then uh, details are uh, details. I can give more details here in our in publications. Uh, and then the feature extraction, the main part which we're doing is to ex what kind of features can we extract from these signals. Uh, so uh, one area which is uh, gaining a lot of traction is costless continuous blood pressure sensing based on pulse transit time. So um, currently blood pressure is measured using cost-based devices which are not convenient, which are not continuous, which are not bearable. So a new trend is to use pulse transit time and take blood pressure from that. So pulse transit time is a, a metric that can be that uh, that can be measured by having a proximal timing and distal timing, and uh, it's inversely proportional to blood pressure. So for proximal timing, uh, what we did was, was we used the seismocardiogram peak, and for distal timing, uh, we evaluated different methodologies: acoustic measurements, PPG measurements. So this proximal timing, usually people are doing it with ECG. There's uh, some uh, error with that. So we propose SCG, seismocardiogram, as it directly measures the AOP. And then the distal timing also, we evaluate different kinds. So here our figure shows different timings. So we have acoustic, seismocardiogram, and PPG signals. And we annotated them. We evaluated different peaks. So we have six kind of different pulse transit times. We evaluated all of them to see which one is better, which one correlates more better with blood pressure. And so, uh, so again, we found we, we found almost similar performance with uh, PPG and acoustic signals. So each has its own advantage. So in this work, we didn't get a definite result. So PPG has some advantages, acoustic has certain advantages, um, but definitely seismocardiogram is better than ECG signals. And uh, we move, what, are, what we are doing currently is to have a smartphone only solution with that. So previously the, we had commercial sensors attached to the, uh, to the chest wall. Uh, this is much more simplified, much more, uh, much more easy because, it's, uh, because smartphones currently have accelerometer gyroscope. So what we want to do is place it on the heart, use accelerometer gyroscope from there for the proximal timing, and then uh, have a finger sensitivity sensor to connect it perhaps to the audio jack of the cell phone. So that gives you the distal timing. So just by having your cell phone, you could put it on your chest wall and measure the pulse transit time and then blood pressure. So this would be much more convenient to hold the wearable, how the wearable system. So this is the state of our work right now. Then you can give more information if you're interested. Uh, uh, and one area which we are also currently working is we started collaborating with the Columbia University for cardiac abnormality classification. So uh, our innovation currently is that uh, basically algorithms, each current algorithms, each detects one type of disease. 
So uh, it's in, in a context of a context of wearable sensors. So the person wearing the device might develop s several types of disease. We don't know what kind of disease it's going to have. So several algorithms to run on this device, uh, each one detects one kind of disease. So this is very slow because multiple algorithms running in parallel, in parallel uh, it requires high power consumption and therefore it's not suitable for home-based wearable monitoring. What we propose is a binary classification. So uh, we want to see if this patient is healthy or not healthy. If it's healthy, fine. If not healthy, there's an alarm which is triggered and then the patient has to go to the hospital and then inside the hospital we have access to more uh, equipment. We can do specific disease detection algorithms which can run in parallel to detect the specific disease this person has. And so again, our approach is based on cardiomechanical signals. So we don't have a halter, we don't have ECG. We wanted to just based on this kind of signals, can we do abnormality classification? So we collected a variety of cardiovascular disease patients from Colombia. We have healthy patients from uh, our community, from uh, from the Stevens area and uh, the neighborhood. So this is a setup in the hospital measurement. So we connect uh, seismo, gyro, cardiogram signals, we connect reference measurements, and this is our algorithm, which is based on time frequency analysis, uh, and then binary classification. So it's a, a type of general machine learning algorithm. So uh, based on time frequency, we train the algorithm, we do binary classification, and then develop the model. So um, some time frequency analysis, I already mentioned that the machine learning framework with classical binary classification. Uh, so we got a high, we got a good uh, detection rate for this type of algorithm, uh, and we so this uh, so what we should do we compare we're going to compare with specific disease algorithms to see if we can get comparable detection rates. So we're going to present in EMBC in August this year. If you're interested, the paper is coming, um, and then finally, uh, the, uh, what we are going to do in this area, as I said, smartphone only blood pressure monitoring with loose contacts. So if you, even if you have the cell phone in your pocket or on your, uh, on your shirt, it, it, we can have some techniques to get rid of noise there. Uh, and then, we, as I said, we have general abnormality classification. We're going to move to specific detection algorithms for cardiovascular or CVD, cardiovascular diseases detection. Uh, and then the model, the combined model, that was a very preliminary model uh, which I presented. We're going to develop it further. And then our final goal is to this, have this set up. We have a shoulder strap which has a, an array of gyroscope accelerometers. So they're lightweight, they're low cost, they're, uh, they're, they're low power. So it's like a strap you can wear and it's, it can have a detailed analysis of cardiovascular health status. So we can use it during athletic activities, get rid of uh, noise. Um, you can do your wearable uh, CBD cardi cardiac disease patients can wear it at home. They, they don't need to stay at the hospital. So, okay, that's a long term practice. Okay. Okay.